we're being introduced to these key buildings, the history of the United Kingdom, uh, the throne room at St. James's Palace, and as you've just spelled out, the history at Westminster Hall. Uh, tell me, David, they, we've had the outline of, of, of the next week today. We now know the funeral will be on Monday. We know that the coffin will arrive at Westminster Hall on Wednesday. That's the outline, but there's a huge amount of detail that will now go into the planning and the anticipation of its arrival. Yes, um, one of the things I think which um, will interest and even perhaps concern the public most of all, and that is who will be allowed to uh, go and pay their respects to um, the Queen, the late Queen or her coffin in Westminster Hall. Um, as we've heard on the news just now, uh, the Queen's coffin will lie um, is lying at the moment in Balmoral in the ballroom there and uh, the, the staff who've worked for the royal household are paying their respects there. The coffin will then move to Edinburgh and uh, the public will have an opportunity in Edinburgh uh, to pay their respects in person. When the coffin comes to Westminster Hall it will be received by the royal family and a service will be conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury, quite a brief service. Immediately after that, the two Houses of Parliament, the House of Lords and the House of Commons, uh, will pay their respects, led by the speakers and the political party leaders. They will file past the coffin and pay their respects. That won't take very long, only probably a matter of, of uh, maybe 10 minutes or so. Hmm. Then the hall will be closed in order to make preparations for the public to enter. And the public will then be enter, be able to enter and file past the coffin for the next, um, let's say five days. It, it'll vary depending on uh, when the coffin arrives exactly, when the funeral preparations have to be made. But for about five days, 24 seven, the public will be able to file into Westminster Hall and past. And then the question will come is, how do you join the queue? Because if you've seen the number of people who are paying tributes, leaving tributes at the royal palaces, and the number of flowers and the crowds gathering round, um, I suspect a huge number of people will want to pay their respects to the Queen. Mm. The queue uh, and the details for how to join that queue will be published, I have no doubt, in the next days. Uh, and I don't want to, I'm not up to date with the detailed plans, no. so I, I won't try and, uh, and give any of the details, except to give a very, very rough idea that, um, and again, the geography of where the queue will take place is something I wouldn't say now anyway, partly for security reasons, and partly also because the route changes um, depending on what building works and so on are going on, which roads are, have been dug up and, and so on. And that, and but to yeah. give you an illustrative example of where the route might go, it could start, for example, around Tower Bridge, and that's where people would join the queue. Goodness and me. then that's it a would long snake way along, yeah. along the south bank, across Lambeth Bridge, into Victoria Tower Gardens, and then... Um, just after Victoria Tower Gardens in Old Palace Yard, and in fact, if you go there today, you can see it being constructed, there will be a, a huge airport-style security where people will go through um, a bag check um, and uh, a body scan, um, and, and they will go through that. And immediately after that security check, they will enter into the Palace of Westminster, and then they will have a chance to see Westminster Hall Everybody who goes in will, will walk down the steps, um, so overlooking Westminster Hall, overlooking the coffin on the catafalque with the, uh, with the guard, um, ceremonial guard standing around the coffin, and then they will file past on either side of the coffin. Question is how many people will, will be able to do that? Uh, there has to be a limit. It can't go on for days and days. Uh, the queue will be fed in. There will be announcements about how the queue is getting on and how many more people uh, will be able to get in. And there will be eventually a stop at the end of the queue so that the people at the end know that they will get in and people joining the queue after that won't because obviously uh, the queue, the hall will have to close in time for the coffin to be moved uh, to the funeral next Monday. 
on Monday week, Monday the 19th. Um, how many people? I wouldn't have a guess. We have a pretty good, we had a pretty good idea because we, we, uh, we did tests and trials of how long it takes to walk past the coffin, how many people you can get in at one time and from previous lying in states. Um, let me say it'll be well, well over tens of thousands, well over tens of thousands. Wow. More than, more than 200,000, but I'm not going to give you any Cheering idea. all the way down to that. London Bridge. Um, we've missed our headlines, but it's just such detail that we've not had from anyone else, and I would expect no one other than the person who has been Black Rod to know that kind of detail. David, uh, David Leakey, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of your thoughts and also that extraordinary amount of detail. Thank you very much. Pleasure. So now we know, queues all the way down to London Bridge. And actually judging by uh, the long queues we saw on the long walk at Windsor today, that wouldn't be entirely surprising, would it? So many people in the country and from around the world want to be here to pay their respects uh, to the Queen. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the detail that we've had. The state funeral, as I said, for Queen Elizabeth will take place on Monday, the 19th of September at 11 a.m. Uh, that's BST for people overseas at Westminster Abbey. Schools will close on the day of the funeral, giving thousands of youngsters the chance to watch the televised service and pay their respects. We've also had more detail on the key events that will happen in the next week as the funeral approaches, which David has just been setting out for you. So here is a bit of that detail. The, the coffin is to leave Balmoral tomorrow, Sunday the 11th, at 10 a.m., carried by six of the estate's gatekeep gamekeepers. It will then be taken uh, to the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh by road, where it will arrive at around four o'clock. On the afternoon of Monday the 12th, there will be a short procession of the coffin along the Royal Mile to St. Giles's Cathedral, with the King and the Queen Consort following on foot. A service will be held, attended by members of the Royal Family, and the Queen will remain at St. Giles for a short period of lying at rest. In the evening, there will be a vigil. And then the coffin will be taken to Edinburgh Airport at five o'clock in the afternoon of Tuesday the 13th of September. It, from there it will be flown to London, accompanied by the Princess Royal. It will arrive at Buckingham Palace in the evening, witnessed by King Charles and the Queen Consort Camilla. The next day, Wednesday, September the 14th, at just after two o'clock in the afternoon, the Queen's coffin will be adorned with the crown and a wreath of flowers and travel on a gun carriage from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall in silence. The route will take in Queen's Gardens, the Mall, Horse Guards and Horse Guards Arch, Whitehall, Parliament Street, Parliament Square and New Palace Yard. King Charles and members of the royal family will join the procession. It is being described as a, a small and personal procession. But during that procession, there will be guns fired at Hyde Park and Big Ben will toll. The Queen will lie in state at Westminster Hall for four full days after a short service by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The lying in state will end on September the 19th, the day of the Queen's funeral. The lying in state will end at 6.30 on the morning of September the 19th, the day the Queen's funeral takes place at 11 o'clock in the morning. So that gives you a little bit of detail about how uh, the week will unfold. Uh, let's go to uh, Buckingham Palace. Rebecca Jones has been watching events there for us today. Um, uh, the King has now left Buckingham Palace. We saw um, the cortege, small cortege, leave the, the palace about a, kind of three quarters of an hour ago, Rebecca, and I noted that there was a rather impromptu stop on the mall. Do we know what happened? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's been a very busy day here for the new king. He travels straight to Buckingham Palace from St James's Palace after that accession council where he was formally proclaimed the king. And he arrived about 12.15. And as you said, he left Christian just after six o'clock to the delight of the crowds who have just grown and grown and grown during the course of the day. Far more people here today than there have been in the last couple of days. I should say, 
most of them here to pay their respects to the Queen. That much was clear by the number of floral tributes that there were. Uh, lots and lots of people clutching bouquets with drawings attached, messages attached. I was particularly struck by one uh, from a little girl called Holly, who was uh, seven and she'd written, sorry that the Queen has died and gone to heaven. I liked her corgis. But uh, as you say, the crowd were rewarded with a glimpse of the king uh, just after six o'clock. He didn't stop as he did yesterday and speak to the crowds outside the palace, but carried on up the mall and then spoke to some of the people who had been waiting there, six, seven, eight, nine deep, before carrying on to Clarence House, where he met up with the Queen Consort Camilla, and there he did another impromptu walkabout. Uh, Rebecca Jones, uh, thank you very much for that. Let's go to Charlotte Gallagher, who is also there, but a bit further down uh, the mile. Um, around the area where the king stopped just a short time ago, Charlotte? He did indeed. And I tell you, as soon as that car emerged from the gates of Buckingham Palace and people saw that the royal standard was on top of the car, so they knew that King Charles was in there, the cheers were enormous. People have waited all day, some people. People have come down from Newcastle, from Swindon, met someone from Germany that had come over just for this moment. So people were so excited to see the new king and also, importantly, pay respects to Queen Elizabeth. Lots of children here today. Some of them told me about how they saw her with Paddington at the Jubilee and how they loved that so much. And that was their real abiding memory of Queen Elizabeth. And you talked earlier about floral tributes. And we've got some very, very special ones here from Floris, professional Floris. What's your name? Natalie. Natalie. And just, this is absolutely beautiful. Oh, actually, young Emma made this. <laughs> Which is really nice. So, yeah, we all love the Queen and obviously all the royals, and we just wanted to make something really special to bring down. And the colours particularly chosen for yeah, the Queen? Yeah, we've done a whole display in our shop just so people can come down and pay respects. And whereabouts did you come down from? Uh, Rose Hill in Carl Shorten. So were you going to come down anyway, or was this specifically to come to Buckingham Palace to lay these flowers? Uh, just to lay the flowers, yeah. And what did the Queen mean to you? Oh, absolutely everything. Um, just, we were talking about this yesterday, weren't we, Steph? That it was, it's childhood. It's, it's our childhood. And now I feel my, like I'm going to get older because she's gone, if that makes sense. Totally. I feel like that as well. And it's something yeah. that, even if you didn't think about her all the time, she was always there. Yeah, like, exactly. Like stable figure. Another grandmother. Yeah. Another grandmother. And you're hoping to lay these outside? Yeah, I don't think we'll get any closer, but as long as we can lay them nearby, we've got... A few from customers as well that have asked us to take some down for them. Oh, that's lovely. And I know you did want to see the king, but unfortunately you didn't quite make it in no. time. No, because <laughs> we, were, we were all at work, so didn't quite make it, but I'm sure we will another time. Yeah, well, it, you know, it shows how much people think about the royal family, that even though you're working, mm. it's a Saturday, and you've come down on Saturday night because you want to oh, yeah. you know, pay your respects. Yeah, it had to be done. Yeah, and let's talk to some of the other florists, star florists. What's Favorite? your name? Steph. So you made this gorgeous Little bouquet. Emma, yeah. yeah, so like Nat said, it's just one of those things that we're all really proud to have someone who, who's reigned so long in our country. And she was a constant. And my mum, seeing my mum so upset, kind of brought it home because she's been a part of all of our lives. And then to know that my nieces and nephews will now grow up with kings, it's just, yeah, it's just so special to all of us, so. And like a few people have said, we will never see a queen again, will yeah. we? It's, it's going yeah, to be kings now. it's just one of those things. But as sad as it is, it's also a new moment. So we're here to celebrate that as well. And I noticed you put thistles in the bouquet. Is that because the queen loves Scotland yeah. so much? Yeah, so it's just a little nod to that as well. So yeah. But out Emma made it, so I can't take credit, Emma made it. <laughs> and you were saying customers have come in and they've wanted to lay flowers here and you've brought them down with you. Yeah, so we've had quite a few people come in today and buy some to lay down and it's lovely, it's just lovely. And what did you think when you heard the news about Queen Elizabeth? It was awful, wasn't it? It was just so sad. But we're just paying our respect in the way we know. We've all grown up with her, haven't we? It's like she's been... Yeah. We've seen so many things happen through yeah. her life. It's, as you said earlier, she was just always there. And it just, like, when I think about it now, I still don't believe it's real, almost. It still hasn't hit. And it's just to, I'm really excited that we've got a new king, but it's just knowing that our queen, like, we probably won't ever have a queen again. 
it's just it's really sad and he came out to huge cheers so many people yeah. wanting to see that because obviously for him he's grieving his mother but he's got to start this new job yeah. he's got to grieve in public as well it must be really difficult for him yeah yeah was it worth coming down there just to oh definitely definitely yeah 100%, yeah. yeah even just for the atmosphere there's that's what's the nicest thing about Britain is regardless of anything or the diversity everyone just comes together as one so I'm very proud to be British and I'd say that actually the diversity in the crowds people from all over the UK all over the world coming here to pay their respects to the Queen but also really to celebrate her life that's been a big theme from the people I've spoken to I mentioned Paddington lots of children saying how they she made them laugh which I think is so special and I'm sure something that she would have loved yes indeed so it's very important actually a point just one of your guests was making there that we will have to get used to having a king for maybe many many years because the line of succession of course flows through William and, and George but it is worth pointing out that the Queen gave royal assent in 2013 um, that meant both sons and daughters of any future UK monarch would have an equal right to the throne. So uh, were George to have a daughter, we could have a queen again, which is an important detail and obviously um, uh, makes reference to the point that the queen um, wanted uh, women to have uh, that role in future life. Um, let's talk a little bit about King Charles um, and his walkabout this afternoon, which we've been hearing about. I want to make some reference to the car because there's been a very purposeful choice of this car it's a rolls royce phantom six there are two of these uh, in the royal household if anyone's been to sandringham you'll know that there is a car museum at sandringham with many of the cars that the royal family own but this one has been picked for a purpose because you'll see as it pulls past that you can see the king and he wants to be seen of course uh, he wants to be able to um uh, speak to the public as we saw with the walkabout yesterday and be seen as he's driving around at this very important time. Uh, this particular one in fact was uh, has been in the, the household for 40 years and it was used by the new Princess of Wales when she travelled to Westminster Abbey to marry William. Um, so you will have seen that car before but you'll see very shortly it suddenly parks up uh, and then uh, the King hops out of it to meet some of those well-wishers on uh, the bar barriers and this happened don't forget uh, about a few minutes after uh, the two princes harry and william uh, reconciled at windsor were walking around doing a similar thing so uh, in their grief um the royal family uh, making time for the public uh, and as you've just been hearing from charlotte people have come from all over not just from all over the country but people making their way here uh, from all over the world to buckingham palace uh, to be part of this, um, to share in a national moment, and of course, uh, to thank the Queen for her extraordinary reign, the 70 years of service that she gave us. Uh, so that was King Charles III, uh, just walking around not very long ago. Meanwhile, as I say, in Windsor, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have appeared together in a surprise show of unity this evening. Uh, we didn't know that the Sussexes were going to be there, but they walked down the long walk together, taking floral tributes, meeting members of the public outside uh, the castle. Our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, has more. Unexpected and unannounced, nobody had seen this coming. After the rancor and the conflict, the fallout and the friction, this was a family reunited in grief. The new Prince and Princess of Wales, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, together in Windsor to view the flowers and see those who had come to mourn the Queen. All eyes were on them. The brothers have barely spoken to each other for two years, but today something clearly shifted. Harry and Meghan walked down one side of the crowd on Windsor's long walk up to the castle, chatting, receiving flowers and condolences. On the other side were William and Catherine, doing much the same, particularly focusing on families and children who had come out to remember the Queen. It's hard to imagine quite how this moment came about. Perhaps the public outpouring of love for the Queen and the weight of responsibility their father now bears 
caused Harry and William to find a peace that has previously been hard to reach. It was an extraordinary moment of solidarity that seemed to please all those there to witness it. In her death, the Queen appears to have helped heal a damaging rift as the royal family comes together to say their farewell. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. It's a walkabout that lasted uh, a good half an hour and at times the prince is in deep conversation uh, with people on uh, the barricades. Now, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, has paid tribute to the Queen today in a statement, so let me read that to you. On Thursday, the world lost an extraordinary leader whose commitment to the country, the realms and the Commonwealth was absolute. So much will be said in the days ahead about the meaning of her historic reign. I, however, have lost a grandmother, and while I will grieve her loss, I also feel incredibly grateful. I have had the benefit of the Queen's wisdom and reassurance into my fifth decade. My wife has had 20 years of her guidance and support. My three children have got to spend holidays with her and will create memories that will last their whole lives. She was by my side at my happiest moments, and she was by my side during the saddest days of my life. I knew this day would come, but it will be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. I thank her for the kindness she showed my family and me, and I thank her on behalf of my generation for providing an example of service and dignity in public life that was from a different age, but always relevant to us all. My grandmother famously said that grief was the price we pay for love. All of the sadness we will feel in the coming weeks will be testament to the love we felt for our extraordinary queen. I will honor her by memory, her memory, by supporting my father, the king, in every way I can. The statement issued uh, by the new Prince of Wales uh, earlier this afternoon. Well, the Queen's three youngest children, Princess Anne and Princess Andrew and Edward, along with their families, remain at Balmoral this evening, and today they were at a church service, after which they took time to read and admire the growing floral tributes outside the castle gates. From there, Sarah Campbell reports. It's not long now until the late Queen leaves this beautiful part of Scotland forever, a place which was so close to her heart. Before she starts her final journey tomorrow, people travelled here to say their own goodbyes. The Queen's family was on the minds of many of those here today. And this afternoon, the castle gates opened and in convoy, three of the Queen's children, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, Princess Anne and their families made their way to the local church for a private service. During her lifetime, the Queen talked about the strength and comfort she found through her faith. And during the long summer months here on the Balmoral Estate, she worshipped here at Crathy Kirk. In its familiar surroundings, her family came together today to pray. It was a short service, and afterwards, the three families left the vehicles and walked across the bridge over the River Dee to the people who had come to pay their respects. This is a family event, and I just feel incredibly solemn for that. They've got such a solemn time ahead of them as a family. It's important that he's aware, because, of course, he'll only know really a king rather than a queen. Yeah. It's so sad, you know, and to see her go, and it will be look so different. It's just amazing. She, she was such an amazing woman. She, she did so much. It is still just two days since the queen died and the emotion was clear as family members comforted one another. Taking time to read some of the hundreds of messages left at the castle gates in tribute to their mother and grandmother. Before returning back behind castle walls, they stopped and looked back. Prince Andrew, in a rare public appearance, led a wave, which was acknowledged by the crowd. A mutual recognition of the loss the family and the nation is coming to terms with. 
Sarah Campbell reporting there uh, on the events at Balmoral. Now, Charles III became monarch immediately after the death of his mother. He was formally proclaimed king today at St. James's Palace in London. In a ceremony which dates back centuries and which was televised for the first time in its history, the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was officially confirmed before the new monarch swore his oath. King Charles paid tribute to his late mother, saying her reign had been unequalled in dedication, duration and devotion. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell was watching today's events. In the setting of London's original royal palace at St James's, the Accession Council, Britain's political leaders past and present with other notable figures, there to pledge their allegiance to Britain's new head of state. God save the King. God save the King. The King joined the Accession Council gathered in the palace's throne room to make his declaration. It is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the Queen. I know how deeply you, the entire nation, and I think I may say the whole world, sympathize with me in the irreparable loss we've all suffered. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands and of the Commonwealth realms and territories throughout the world. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. Concerning the security of the Church of Scotland. The King took a centuries-old oath to preserve the position of the Church of Scotland. I, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of my other realms and territories, King, Defender of the Faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland. Watched by the heir to the throne, Prince William, Prince of Wales, and Camilla the Queen Consort, he signed the oath Charles R. Charles Rex, King. And then a moment of pageantry. From a balcony, the Garter King of Arms issued the proclamation of the new king's reign. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We, therefore, do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord Charles III. The King's Guard gave three cheers. Three cheers for His Majesty the King. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. 
following centuries-old tradition, the proclamation was also issued in the City of London. It will be repeated in Britain's other national capitals tomorrow. Hooray! Hip hip! Affirming and proclaiming the reign of Charles III to all corners of his kingdom. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. Yeah, as Nicholas says, such a compelling day. Echoes of history, the protocol and the pageantry mixed with the new. Never before have we seen an accession council declare a new king. We'll have plenty more uh, of the day's events surrounding uh, the death of Queen Elizabeth II, but let's take this opportunity just to look at some of the other day's events, starting with Ukraine, because of, after months of deadlock, uh, the counter-offensive against Russia is starting to gather momentum with more territory recaptured in the south and the east of the country. Ukrainian troops are said to have entered Kupyansk, a railway city that has acted as a key logistics centre for Russian forces in the northeast since February. In some areas, the Russian retreat is said to have been a rout, and there are reports that the Russians have now pulled out from around Izium. That's uh, uh, just there to the north-northeast on the map as you look at it. Moscow says it is moving out to regroup elsewhere. From central Ukraine, our senior international correspondent Oligarin reports. Ukraine's rapid counter-offensive is gaining ground. Its troops taking some casualties, but also taking territory on several fronts. Catching Russian forces off guard even surprising some Ukrainians. This footage was filmed by Ukrainian forces. We can't document the battles ourselves. For now, journalists have been banned from the front lines. Kyiv determined to win the information war. And images of victory from the eastern city of Kupiansk this was a key logistics hub for President Putin's men. In some areas, Russia's front line has collapsed. And liberation has come. Everything is okay, troops tell locals in the town of Balatlia. For six months, we prayed you would come, she says. Natalia, too, endured months under occupation by the Russians, who she calls fascists. She and her husband Volodymyr were freed by the counteroffensive, but still show signs of their trauma. When you saw the Ukrainian soldiers, when you realized they had come to free you, what was that moment like? What were your feelings? We thought we would never see them. And then our boys came. And they were so handsome. So beautiful. Especially compared to the fascists. I didn't know what to do with them, if I should hug them or hold their hands. I touched them and I was very happy. Ukrainian social media has been flooded with patriotic videos. The national anthem, now a battle hymn for troops, who believe that momentum is swinging their way. But the Russians still hold around a fifth of Ukraine, including the city of Kherson. This was the resistance on the streets back in March. It was the first major Ukrainian city to fall after the invasion. We managed to reach a woman still living there who says the Russians are starting to lie low. For her protection, we aren't naming her, and her words are spoken by a BBC producer. Over the past two or three days, the military seemed to have quietened down a bit. They are less visible in cafes and restaurants. If street fighting starts, it will be very dangerous. I want to see our army here and thank them. I want to see their victory. Scenes like this are cathartic for Ukraine and reassuring for its Western backers. 
No one imagines a swift end to the war. But the Ukrainians have now shown they can beat the Russians in battle, not just outmaneuver them. Orlegiran, BBC News, Central Ukraine. The UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez has said that Pakistan needs massive financial support following devastating floods that have marooned vast parts of the country. On the second day of his visit to Pakistan, he described the situation as unimaginable. More than 1,400 people have died and millions have been forced to flee their homes. The authorities in Sindh province have made further breaches to the country's largest freshwater lake to prevent flood water breaking its embankments. There are ancient ruins in the south of Sindh near the Indus River that are around four and a half thousand years old and are considered among the best preserved urban settlements in South Asia. Our correspondent Saha Balak has been to visit the site. I'm in the southeastern province of Sindh right now where uh, I got to know that the site of Mohenjo-daro has been badly damaged. As soon as I reached here, I saw a lot of laborers working here uh, trying to repair whatever the rain has damaged. Uh, what I was told was that in mid-August, it rained more than usual. It rained around 1,400 millimeter, which is more than this place has ever received uh, since it was discovered in 1922, which was around 100 years ago. Uh, if you look at this site, uh, the protective layer, which is the outer layer of the stupa, has been totally damaged, but the original layer, that the original stupa, is completely fine. Uh, I spoke with a few experts around here as well, and what they told me was that what protected this space was the fact that these ancient drains, which is around 4,500 year old, uh, actually helped the rain to drain out of this place. It did not take any machinery, it did not take any laborers to help drain out the water, uh, which is a marvel in itself. At the moment, the biggest uh, worry for the people is, especially for the administration, is to protect this place and to bring it back to how it originally was. Most of the stupas around here have five layers of protection around them. And if one of them has been broken, it really jeopardizes the entire situation for this area. It is the oldest uh, site uh, possible in Sindh. And to protect it is the number one worry for the government right now. And what I've been told so far is that they want to make as much reparations over here and to repair it as better as it used to look before. Sahar Balak uh, reporting from Pakistan, such a huge effort, still required, of course, millions of people needing help there uh, in Pakistan. Uh, let's return then to the day's events here in uh, the UK. Another day of huge crowds around the palaces, Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle, to pay their respects to uh, the late Queen uh, Elizabeth. Uh, let me show you the, the scene tonight at Buckingham Palace. Um, uh, the Royal Standard uh, is flying there, I think, but uh, we know that King Charles uh, is about to leave London and will be in Scotland tomorrow for um, uh, the, the procession as the, the Queen's coffin leaves Balmoral. Uh, it will be transferred to Hollywood House um, and, of course, uh, the Queen's children still at, at Balmoral. They, too, have been on walkabout today meeting some of the crowds uh, outside Balmoral. Uh, reading some of the floral tributes. And of course today um, we've been following events at Windsor Castle where we've seen the two princes, Harry and William, the new Prince of Wales, uh, with his brother, uh, on walkabout for about half an hour. Um, uh, quite moving to see the two brothers uh, together and uh, a sense of unity among what is, amid what is a very sad moment of course, uh, for the family. The crown's just starting to thin out a little uh, this evening as as the, uh, the sun goes down. Uh, our correspondent Lucy Manning has been there throughout the day. If ever there was a moment for a child to live through history, to understand kings and queens, to mark the moment one era transitioned into another, this was it. Just a few hundred from the crowds of thousands allowed outside St. James's Palace to hear the new king proclaim. The youngest, Orla Elizabeth, 11 weeks old. It's history, isn't it? And I think by bringing her down today, it's something that we can talk to her about. She'll obviously be spoken to about the queen because she's named after her. Um, and then it's something that she can then pass on to her kids. So what do you make of King Charles so far? I think he's been absolutely uh, incredible, really. And doing all of that, what he did yesterday, um, 
the, you know, the day after his mother died, um, it tastes good. Um, and I thought he was absolutely magnificent. A real sense of trying to involve the people, his subjects, to bring them along with the change. Knitted by their grandma, Lottie and Isabel had brought their queens. Why have you brought those down today, girls? Um, because King Charles' mother the is the died. queen. We went to put flowers down for the queen. It's a moment of history. We wanted the girls to come and pay their respects and uh, see the new king. It will be a changing era, but I think the public are behind Charles and King Charles, and uh, it will support him all the way. Not everyone had the best view, but we are all living through, experiencing this new era. Thankfully today I'm not crying because yesterday I was crying very much. So, What did you make of the proclamation ceremony? I mean, like, it, it's emotional. I, oh, my God, Prince Charles is a king and the Queen is not there anymore. Buckingham Palace was enveloped by people, mournful, celebratory, a swirl of changing emotions. There are vast crowds, seven, eight people deep on both sides of the mall. Everyone just trying to get a glimpse of the new king. The royal car slowing so that everyone here could say they'd seen King Charles. It was worth the wait. Brilliant. How long did you wait for? Uh, we think we've been here about three hours. <laughs> so, Why did you want to come now? Uh, I just wanted to be part of this, uh, just so important, just to be part of the moment. And what do you make of the new king? He's, I like him, I like Charlie, he's good, yeah, I, I really like Charlie. Rufus, you, you just saw the king? Yeah. <laughs> how, how was that? Um, amazing, I, I won't forget it, yeah. yeah. A pilgrimage to the palace, flowers to remember the queen, cheers to welcome the king. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Yeah, plenty of crowds out on the mall uh, this afternoon. It's just some detail that we've had today. Of course, we've had the proclamation here in London and at other parts uh, around uh, the country. Uh, we'll come to the Commonwealth in a second, but we know the King will want to be there in person in the nations, uh, and so we understand he's going to Belfast on Tuesday. Uh, there are details of his visit to Wales still to come, and of course he will be in Scotland tomorrow. Uh, when they move uh, the coffin to uh, Hollywood Palace. Um, so the, the King going to be very busy over the course of the next week. Uh, as I say, it did take place, the proclamation, not just in London, uh, but also in places around the Commonwealth and in Ottawa in Canada, where he replaces the Queen, of course, as head of state. Queen Elizabeth made no fewer than 22 state visits there during her reign, more than any other country. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, reports now on how the Canadians are remembering their queen. This morning in Ottawa, bearskin hats and a bugle, a solemn ceremony to confirm a king. His Royal Highness Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign, Charles III. A new head of state Canada, one of 14 Commonwealth countries, former colonies, which still keep the crown. Thank you again for your welcome. It is very good to be home. For seven decades, she drew the crowds here, old and new generations gathering to greet her, displaying affection for her and for what she loved. From Corgi fan clubs in the capital, Ottawa, to fast horses at the Calgary Stampede in the West, Prince Philip enjoying himself too, always at her side. In the east of this former colony, visits to 18th century villages. The Queen crisscrossed the world's second largest mass many times, visiting every single province and territory, embracing Canadian culture, including it's national sport. I think it's absolutely wonderful. She's really touched the spirit of what being a Canadian is all about. But often, the Queen was on thin ice. The separatist extremists were making their promised demonstration. Sometimes the people who showed up came to protest. This was the scene in the mainly French-speaking province of Quebec in 1964, when separatist sentiment was at its highest 
anger over English domination. The Queen knew it, never showed it, steering a middle course. Ottawa is a small capital. From her very first visit as Queen in 1957, she always spoke both of Canada's official languages. Better than even some of Canada's politicians. Another difficult legacy of a darker imperial past. The Indians were so delighted to meet the great white queen. For Canada's indigenous community, the monarchy also symbolizes dispossession, discrimination, horrific abuses Canada's leaders are still confronting. This morning's ceremony to welcome the king sends another signal. The monarch's representative, Governor General Mary Simon, is the first indigenous person to hold this role. Other change could be coming. Recent polls show only a small minority of Canadians feel the monarchy still matters in their lives. But for now, it's still a constant. Lise Doucette, BBC News, Ottawa. Well, the Queen also travelled widely across the UK throughout her long reign, and it's thought that nearly a third of the country saw or even met her during her lifetime. One of the places she visited a number of times was Bolton in Lancashire, and our special correspondent Jeremy Cook has been to the town to speak to people who met and admired her. Away from the capital and the palace and the crowds, a nation's quiet grief. Quiet but profoundly felt. She's beautiful. There'll never be another one like her, will there? I mean, tears just stream down my face and uh, you've got to believe it, but it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. There's sadness here, of course, but gratitude too. So many lives touched by their queen. Telegrams and cards that mean so much. I got one, a special one for my diamond wedding. It's nice with that yeah. Buckingham book Palace mm. um, envelope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we treasure that, we treasure that. Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh leave Bolton Town Hall. Bolton, in our northern heartlands, a royal destination over several decades. In 2009, it was Warburton's Bakery. A short visit, but lifelong memories. She made me feel exceedingly important, and that's what I remember about her. She was all about me on that day. Would it be ridiculous of me to say that that moment, that exchange, actually changed your life? It did, yes, because I'm, I'm still talking about it 13 years later. And, you know, I've met the Queen, um, and I remember she walked away and she turned back to me and she said, keep up the good work. And I said to my colleague who decided, I said, wow. The passing of a monarch is a loss felt in all corners of the country. In offering our deepest condolences and sympathies in passing of our late Queen Elizabeth II. In every one of our communities. She is not just the Queen, she was our Queen, Queen for all communities, whichever faith you were from. Uh, in particular, I'd like to sort of pass my condolences from the community of Makamos and the community as a whole. <clears throat> she was our Queen and we deeply, deeply going to miss her. Al, the bus driver, is a proud monarchist. Good to see you. His patriotic outfit, a heartfelt tribute. I think the whole world is going to miss her. Really, the whole world is going to miss They are. Um, what can we do? We can, we can move on and, as I say, support our new king. Take a moment, though. Karen is all about helping and supporting Bolton's younger generation. She knows the inspiration that the Queen has given, especially on her visits to this town. It makes the community feel like they matter um, as individuals, as a community, as a town. Like, you know, we're not just a place forgotten up in the north uh, when, when the Queen comes to see us, so really, really important. Last word to Tilly, a personal tribute across the generations. Thank you for looking after the country and caring. Hope that you rest in peace. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Bolton. Really well. hmm. 
Well, Books of Condolence have been set up at numerous locations around the UK. Our correspondent Eunice Muller, uh, not far from Bolton, went to one of those places, Manchester Cathedral, to meet some of the people who've gathered there. The late Queen Elizabeth II visited Manchester many times that during those moments of celebration, joy, but also during its darkest hour in the aftermath after that terror attack on the Manchester arena. And over the past day or two, we've seen thousands and thousands of people come through the doors here of Manchester Cathedral to sign that book of condolence, but also to light a candle if they wish to do so. So let's have a, a quick chat with Julie Ann McCulloch um, and her family. You've travelled across from Stockport, haven't you? Why did you want to be here today? Um, the Queen has been a steady force in our world and in our community for so long, um, and for all of my life. Um, and I wanted to come and just write message, a message. I wanted to tell her, even though she's never going to read it, um, that she was a woman of faith, a woman of integrity, that she cared about people. Um, and she cared about them at happy times and at sad times, and she was never frightened um, to have a conversation with people and to share sorrow with them. Many people here will have chosen their words carefully. For you, your background, you were telling me before, you're Northern Irish. Yeah. And that's another reason why you wanted to be here. Very much so. Um, when politicians were frightened to say things, she was happy to say things. She, uh, she kept politics out and she talked about people. She cared about our stories and she wanted to heal division um, instead of allowing division to continue. You so, brought your daughter here as well. Yeah. Sophia, let me have a, a quick chat with you. The Queen meant a lot to you, didn't she? Because I was a brownie, um, and she was a brownie as well. Um, so I feel like it's um, something that I want to do when I'm older. And you wrote a message, didn't you? Yeah. Tell me what you wrote. Um, I wrote something like, um, I was very sad that she passed away, but sh she was a kind, caring woman that looked after everyone and brownies, because she's a very special woman in my heart, because she's a brownie and I'm a brownie. <laughs> If you couldn't put, have put it better, there'd be so many people who'd be saying exactly the same thing. Let's have a quick chat to, to Dad Jamie as well. Jamie, you were a bit reluctant to have a chat with me originally, but actually you do, you have written a message and you yeah. really did want to emphasise that, didn't you? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've heard a lot of, and you know, there's been a lot of words said, is just steadfastness and this, the dignity in which she performed her role. And it was this constant... Um, in my life, that's something that we've always known. But I think for me, what was important, not just her service to our country and to other nations, but the way that she spoke about her faith was a main part of how she felt that she had the strength to carry out that role. You know, in the Queen's lifetime, there were many ups and many downs, but actually the way that she carried herself and the way that she continued to treat others, as Julianne had said, um, through those situations. And I think that was important for me as a person of faith myself, um, even her Christmas messages. But I think most importantly, it was the way that actually she acted um, that faith through her life. And I think that was obvious, not just to us, but I think to people across the world. And that's why it was really important for me to come today with our family, but into a place of worship and to be able to, to kind of give thanks for that and appreciation for how that lived through her life and she really did live out her faith through her life. Okay, Jamie, Sophia and Julia, thanks very much for, for joining me today. Now the Queen, the late Queen was actually here just um, over 12 months ago. At that time she was visiting politicians as she would do but also ordering members of the public uh, and listen to their stories after the pandemic, during the pandemic, and how that had affected them. And I just want to sort of mention one message that was written before in the book of condolence. She was, that person wrote, loyal to the end. Eunice Muller there. That little girl was right. She was very involved with the Brownies and the Guides. In fact, she was uh, a member of the first Buckingham Palace Guides in 1937, later became the patron of Girl Guiding in the country. So she was very involved and very interested in the Brownies and the Girl Guides. Now, the Houses of Parliament convened today for special sessions to mark the death of the Queen and members of Parliament have been swearing allegiance to the King as the new head of state. From Westminster, Damien Grammaticus reports. This is a time of change and continuity too. Written in Westminster's stones, King's past, as a new one ascends at the apex of things. I swear by Almighty God 
that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty, King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to the law. So help me God. I swear by Almighty God that I will be... MPs didn't have to make a new pledge today, but those that chose to could also choose the form it took. ...according to law, so help me God. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm <coughs> that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law. So even in this time of mourning, political life moves forward. New King with his new Prime Minister and her new Cabinet. The tone relaxed, almost familiar. A former Prime Minister says the King has been preparing for this moment. I uh, had audiences with Prince Charles when Queen Elizabeth II was still on the throne because he wanted to start thinking about how to conduct those audiences. And from what I saw, he, he will be brilliant at that job, brilliant at listening, brilliant at asking questions, um, giving wise advice and sage counsel. I mean, this has probably been the longest apprenticeship in history. Your Majesty. I should in next, Sir Keir Starmer with praise for the new King's first address. I thought his speech yesterday was fantastic, by the way. Who did it? Oh, it was encouraging. It was <laughs> so reassuring. No, I think so that... reassuring, he said. Then the Liberal Democrat leader. He gave condolences and said he hoped to discuss shared interests with the King. I'd love to talk to you about some issues on the environment and climate change in due course, but can I first of all offer my sincere condolences? Thank you very much. And finally, the Scottish National Party's leader in Westminster. In the coming days, the King will tour the nation. Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast, the Prime Minister, will accompany him as the nation prepares for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. David Grammaticus, BBC News, Westminster. Very busy day for the new King. Uh, that is it from me this evening. Lucy Hawkins will be here uh, very shortly. Uh, but as she takes the seat, I'm going to play you an interview that we did just a short while ago with David Leakey, who has held the position of Black Rod, formerly Black Rod. That's the monarch's representative in the House of Lords. And he was telling us about his memories and encounters with the Queen. I think one of the most important lessons I learned before I met the Queen for the first time as Black Rod, I'd come, I'd met her uh, on other occasions in the military before that, but the, the most important thing that I was told was that the Queen notices, and she does, and after every state opening of Parliament, um, she would always uh, say goodbye to me or nod as I bowed as she left, and uh, Always a few days later, I would get a message back through uh, the private office, through her private office, of something she'd noticed. And one year, uh, one of the busts of the bishops high up in a gallery in the House of Lords had been removed and was on loan. And after the state opening of Parliament, about three days later, I got a note from the private secretary asking where it was and why it wasn't there. <laughs> so she notices and she spots points of detail. Now, you may say that's trivial and perhaps a bit pedantic almost, but it was because she took an interest. It wasn't just Blackrod who had to up his and now it's Sarah Clark, her game. It's the whole team. It's not just Blackrod. It's the team in the Palace of Westminster and not just in the Palace of Westminster. These state events are huge team events. The government, uh, the London authorities, the Metropolitan Police, the military and so on and so on. And there are huge meetings before these events take place to make detailed plans and it requires everybody working together. And in the Palace of Westminster, I can tell you the, the it, everybody, including uh, the scaffolders, the electricians, the cleaners, everybody took huge pride in, for example, preparing for the state opening of Parliament, and now preparing for the lying in state of the Queen in Westminster Hall. And everybody takes huge pride in it. And I remember one, one of the... Uh, one of the staff, one of the estate staff who was leaving, and I went to his farewell party, and I said, what are you going to miss most? And he said, I'm going to miss the state occasions. He said, it's why I've loved working here for years. Just the, the team effort, the spirit of 
the Queen is coming and we're preparing this for the Queen. And that just made a big difference and almost kept the staff going for a whole year because all throughout the year we'd have periodic planning meetings either for the next state opening of Parliament, lots of planning meetings uh, for the contingency plans for the lying in state for the Queen and, and other events too. And, and, and that's one of the things which provides a bit of constancy in the country. You know that the royal family expect and demand um, and get the high standards from wherever they go and visit, whether it's the Palace of Westminster or anywhere in the country. And that I don't think would be the same if it was just any other old VIP visitor, quite different for the monarch. This is BBC News. I'm Lucy Hawkins with the latest headlines. New details on the Queen's state funeral. It will be held in Westminster Abbey on Monday the 19th of September. King Charles has approved the day as a bank holiday. Princes William and Harry and their wives Kate and Meghan greet crowds in Windsor. And at Balmoral, the Queen's three younger children and their families viewed tributes to her after attending a church service. The new monarch read and signed an oath and paid tribute to the late Queen at his accession ceremony at St James's Palace. It was televised for the first time. God save the King. God save the King. Hundreds of people witnessed the ceremony of the proclamation on a balcony of the palace. Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. Hello and welcome. The state funeral for Queen Elizabeth will take place on Monday, the 19th of September at 11 a.m. BST at Westminster Abbey. Schools will close on the day of the funeral, giving thousands of youngsters the chance to watch the televised service and pay their respects. We've also had more details of the key events that will happen in the next week as the funeral approaches. So let me take you through them. The Queen's coffin is to leave Balmoral tomorrow, Sunday the 11th at 10 a.m., carried by six of the estate's gamekeepers. It will be taken to the palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh by road to arrive at four o'clock. On the afternoon of Monday the 12th, there will be a short procession of the coffin along the Royal Mile to St Giles's Cathedral with the King and Queen Consort following on foot. A service will be held attended by members of the royal family and the Queen will remain at St Giles's for a short period of lying at rest. In the evening, there will be a vigil. The Queen's coffin will be taken to Edinburgh Airport then at five o'clock on the Tuesday, uh, the 13th of September. It will be flown to London, accompanied by the Princess Royal. It will arrive at Buckingham Palace in the evening, witnessed by King Charles and the Queen Consort. The next day, Wednesday, September the 14th, at just after two o'clock in the afternoon, the Queen's coffin will be adorned with the crown and a wreath of flowers and travel on a gun carriage from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall in silence. The route will take in Queen's Gardens, the Mall, Horse Guards and Horse Guards Arch, Whitehall, Parliament Street, Parliament Square and New Palace Yard. King Charles and members of the royal family will join the procession. It's being described, though, as a small and personal procession. And during that procession, there will be guns fired at Hyde Park and Big Ben will toll. The Queen will lie in state at Westminster Hall for four full days after a short service by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The lying in state will end on September the 19th, the day of the Queen's funeral. The lying in state will end at 6.30 in the morning of September the 19th. 
the day the Queen's funeral takes place at 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, not too long ago, King Charles left Buckingham Palace and he was driven to Clarence House. It's a very short distance, just up the mile. And then, as you can see here, once again, he came out and he spent some time meeting members of the public who have come to pay their respects. You'll remember he did this yesterday at Buckingham Palace. It was very emotional. He was with the Queen Consort, Camilla. And now as people continue to gather at royal residences, he, it seems, is continuing with this intention to greet people who have waited so many hours. Obviously matters to him hugely uh, to connect with people, as you can see here, who have showed up to remember his mother and support him. And uh, let's just take you now to Charlotte Gallagher, who is at Buckingham Palace. It was another remarkable moment, uh, Charlotte. How did the crowds respond? There were cheers, almost screams, really, Lucy, because some people have waited all day to see King Charles. They've been pressed against the barriers, hoping that he would do another walkabout and meet people. And it really was. People were ecstatic when he finally came out. What we heard was the car suddenly coming out of Buckingham Palace. And as soon as people saw that it had the royal standard on top of the car and he was in the car, there were just huge, huge cheers. Spoke to lots of families that have come down here today with their children. They want them to witness this historic moment. And a lot of the children have been talking about, of course, their memory of the Queen is the Jubilee and Paddington. That's how they know her, which is really, really lovely to see. And it's a Saturday night. You know, people are coming down after work. They've been working all day or they've been in town. They've really wanted to come and pay their respects and also to welcome the new king. Now, these ladies, you live in London, but you decided to come down tonight, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> and what did you think when you heard the news? It was just a surprise, I think. I wasn't expecting it to happen this soon. And what were your memories of the Queen? Uh, I did actually see her once in Scotland when she opened up a, a new railway track there. And had you gone especially to see the Queen at yes. that point? And what, what did you make of her? I couldn't really see her from, I was quite far away, but she just seemed very nice and respectful. And it's the end of an era because we've yeah. all grown up with the Queen, haven't we? She's been in all our lives. Yeah, she's been a constant, but I mean, we've only had one monarch, so she's been a constant for the last 26 years. Yeah. And of course, probably we'll never have another Queen in our lifetime. It's, it's going to be kings now. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. It's How so do you okay. feel about that? I mean, it's great to have a, a female leading the country, but yeah, I think, I think the others will do a good job. And what about the atmosphere down here tonight? So many people, thousands. Yeah, it's, it's crammed, but yeah, I think they're, it's very sombre. It's, mm -hmm. weird, it's a weird atmosphere in town. Yeah. yeah. And it's the end of an era for the UK and the Commonwealth, so many people. Yeah. No, and, and why did you want to come down tonight? Just to pay my respects, really, and because she's been, she's been there like as long as I've been alive, obviously. Yeah, and having a king, it's such a change, isn't it? People are, need to remember not to say Prince Charles, say King Charles this time. Yeah. 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 It's really lots of people saying that. It's so strange almost having Prince Charles in your life this long and then suddenly now he's King Charles. Lots of other people coming down. Let's have a seat, grab a few more people. Excuse me. Hi, we're from BBC News. Do you mind having a quick chat? Um, Why did you come down here tonight? Just to pay our respects to the Queen. And are you, um, are you from London? We, we moved out of London a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, we've lived here for a decade or so. And you just came down specifically to lay the flowers today? Uh, yes. And yeah. how did you feel when you heard the news? Uh, devastated, sad, sad for her family. Um, yeah. What were your kind of rem rem memories of the Queen? Um, I think when I came here as a young boy with my family um, and been in awe and wonder of the palace, probably. I'm really sorry I have to go. No, my that's fine. No. Myself, so. <laughs> Lots of people coming down trying to get to the uh, Green Park and lay flowers. So many floral tributes. In fact, they had to remove them from outside Buckingham Palace, Lucy, because there was just too many people, thousands and thousands of people coming down here. Even Green Park Tube Station, which is the nearest tube station, you know, that very rarely stops or shuts for anything. London is open all the time, but that closed today because there were so many people. And I don't know if you can see Buckingham Palace. It's very dark tonight, but the royal standard is still flying. Now, Prince Charles isn't actually in Buckingham Palace at the moment. He's just round the corner in Clarence House. So he's in the royal estate, so the flag is still flying above Buckingham Palace. And I'm sure tomorrow 
there's going to be even more people coming down. If on a Saturday night you're getting crowds like this, you won't be able to see, but what I can see is thousands and thousands of people still queuing to come and lay flowers for the Queen and also to welcome the King. Charlotte, I got the tube into the BBC today and there were so many hundreds of people and of course Green Park Station was closed as well, but there were so many people on the tube and I was talking to them about their memories of the Queen and as you speak to people there today, does it feel like there's any kind of generational divide in, in terms of the stories and things that they're sharing, the memories that they're sharing? Definitely. I think when you speak to people of the Queen's generation or perhaps a bit younger, they remember her as a young woman becoming a mother, becoming a grandmother. And they say they felt like they grew up with her. They had grandchildren around the same time. And then when you speak to younger people, especially children, they of course talk about the Jubilee. They talk about Paddington, someone else mentioned today, of course, about when the Queen, well, not the Queen, obviously, jumped out of a plane to open the London 2012 Olympics. And what's really interesting is there's people from right across the world. I spoke to a man from Germany, him and his girlfriend were on holiday in Paris this week. When they heard that Queen Elizabeth had died, they decided to change the holiday and they've come to London. And they said they're going to stay for the rest of the week and really take in the atmosphere because it does feel like a really momentous moment, not just for the UK, but for the world. I mean, we saw the front pages of newspapers right across the world and Queen Elizabeth was on the front cover of practically every single one. She was the world's most famous woman. And I think a lot of people come as well. They want to pay their respects to King Charles because he's got a really difficult task. He's obviously grieving his mum and is now taking on, you know, probably the most high profile job in the world. Charlotte, lovely to have you with us and to hear some of those stories as well that you've been collecting throughout the evening. We are going to reflect uh, on the influence of the Queen all over the world. We'll be going live to Canada shortly, actually, to bring you the views of Canadians there too. But let's bring you some other pictures and moments from the day and take you to Windsor, where the new Prince and Princess of Wales and, as you can see here, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They appeared together. Now, it was slightly surprising, some people have said, a remarkable show of unity uh, from both of the couples. And they spent quite a lot of time looking at floral tributes outside the castle and then they went walking about, meeting with people, uh, having conversations, it appeared to be incredibly meaningful uh, to them and certainly to those that had gathered. And our Royal Correspondent, Daniela Ralph, was there. Unexpected and unannounced, nobody had seen this coming. After the rancor and the conflict, the fallout and the friction, this was a family reunited in grief. The new Prince and Princess of Wales, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, together in Windsor to view the flowers and see those who had come to mourn the Queen. All eyes were on them. The brothers have barely spoken to each other for two years, but today something clearly shifted. <laughs> Harry and Meghan walked down one side of the crowd on Windsor's long walk up to the castle, chatting, receiving flowers, and condolences. On the other side were William and Catherine, doing much the same, particularly focusing on families and children who had come out to remember the Queen. It's hard to imagine quite how this moment came about. Perhaps the public outpouring of love for the Queen and the weight of responsibility their father now bears caused Harry and William to find a peace that has previously been hard to reach. It was an extraordinary moment of solidarity that seemed to please all those there to witness it. In her death, the Queen appears to have helped heal a damaging rift as the royal family comes together to say their farewell. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Charles III became monarch immediately after the death of his mother, and now he has been formally proclaimed king at St. James's Palace in London. It's a ceremony which dates back centuries and was televised for the first time in its history. The death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was officially confirmed before the new monarch swore an oath. 
King Charles paid tribute to his late mother, saying her reign had been unequaled in dedication, duration and devotion. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell has been watching today's events. In the setting of London's original Royal Palace at St James's, the Accession Council, Britain's political leaders past and present with other notable figures, there to pledge their allegiance to Britain's new head of state. God save the King. God save the King. The King joined the Accession Council gathered in the palace's throne room to make his declaration. It is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the Queen. I know how deeply you, the entire nation, and I think I may say the whole world, sympathize with me in the irreparable loss we've all suffered. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands and of the Commonwealth realms and territories throughout the world. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. Concerning the security of the Church of Scotland. The King took a centuries-old oath to preserve the position of the Church of Scotland. I, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of my other realms and territories, King, defender of the faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland. Watched by the heir to the throne, Prince William, Prince of Wales, and Camilla the Queen Consort, he signed the oath Charles R. Charles Rex, King. And then a moment of pageantry. From a balcony, the Garter King of Arms issued the proclamation of the new king's reign. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We, therefore, do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. The King's Guard gave three cheers. Three cheers for His Majesty the King. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Following centuries-old tradition, the proclamation was also issued in the City of London. It will be repeated in Britain's other national capitals tomorrow. Hooray! Hip, hip! Affirming and proclaiming the reign of Charles III to all corners of his kingdom. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News.
Let's take you back to Buckingham Palace now. Rebecca Jones has been watching events unfold during the course of the day. It has been a very busy day here for the new king. He travels straight to Buckingham Palace from St James's Palace after that accession council where he was formally proclaimed the king and he arrived about 12.15. He left just after six o'clock to the delight of the crowds who have just grown and grown and grown during the course of the day. Far more people here today than there have been in the last couple of days. I should say most of them here to pay their respects to the Queen. That much was clear by the number of floral tributes that there were. Uh, lots and lots of people clutching bouquets with drawings attached, messages attached. I was particularly struck by one uh, from a little girl called Holly, who was uh, seven and she'd written, sorry that the Queen has died and gone to heaven. I liked her corgis, but uh, the crowd were rewarded with a glimpse of the king uh, just after six o'clock. He didn't stop as he did yesterday and speak to the crowds outside the palace, but carried on up the mall and then spoke to some of the people who had been waiting there, six, seven, eight, nine deep, before carrying on to Clarence House where he met up with the Queen Consort Camilla and there he did another impromptu walkabout. Well, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, has paid tribute to the Queen in a statement, and here is part of it. On Thursday, the world lost an extraordinary leader whose commitment to the country, the realms, and the Commonwealth was absolute. My grandmother famously said that grief was the price we pay for love. All of the sadness we will feel in the coming weeks will be testament to the love that we felt for our extraordinary Queen. And I will honour her memory by supporting my father, the King, in every way I can. And we saw William uh, earlier at Windsor. Well, uh, the Queen's three youngest children, Princess Anne, Princess Andrew and Edward, and along with their families, are still in Balmoral. And today, following a church service, they took time to read and admire the growing floral tributes outside the castle gates. From there, Sarah Campbell reports. It's not long now until the late Queen leaves this beautiful part of Scotland forever, a place which was so close to her heart. Before she starts her final journey tomorrow, people travelled here to say their own goodbyes. The Queen's family was on the minds of many of those here today. And this afternoon, the castle gates opened and in convoy, three of the Queen's children, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, Princess Anne and their families made their way to the local church for a private service. During her lifetime, the Queen talked about the strength and comfort she found through her faith. And during the long summer months here on the Balmoral Estate, she worshipped here at Crathy Kirk. In its familiar surroundings, her family came together today to pray. It was a short service, and afterwards, the three families left the vehicles and walked across the bridge over the River Dee to the people who had come to pay their respects. This is a family event and I just feel incredibly solemn for that they've got such a solemn time ahead of them as a family. It's important that he's aware because of course he'll only know really a king rather than a queen. Yeah. It's so sad, you know, and to see her go and it'll be look so different. It's just amazing. She, she was such an amazing woman. She, she did so much. It is still just two days since the queen died and the emotion was clear as family members comforted one another. Taking time to read some of the hundreds of messages left at the castle gates in tribute to their mother and grandmother. Before returning back behind castle walls, they stopped and looked back. Prince Andrew, in a rare public appearance, led a wave, which was acknowledged by the crowd. A mutual recognition of the loss the family and the nation is coming to terms with. Sarah Campbell there. The UK's cabinet has held an audience with King Charles after he was formally proclaimed monarch in succession to the late Queen. Liz Truss took her senior ministers to Buckingham Palace to be received by the sovereign for the first time. Following the cabinet audiences, the King spent some time meeting the leaders of Britain's opposition parties, including, uh, as we've just seen, the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer. 
The Houses of Parliament convene today for special sessions to continue marking the death of the Queen, and members of Parliament had been swearing allegiance to the King as the new head of state. From Westminster, Damon Grammaticus reports. This is a time of change and continuity too. Written in Westminster's stones, King's past, as a new one ascends at the apex of things. I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty, King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. I swear by Almighty God that I will be... MPs didn't have to make a new pledge today, but those that chose to could also choose the form it took. ...according to law, so help me God. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law. So even in this time of mourning, political life moves forward. New King with his new Prime Minister and her new Cabinet. The tone relaxed, almost familiar. A former Prime Minister says the King has been preparing for this moment. I uh, had audiences with Prince Charles when Queen Elizabeth II was still on the throne because he wanted to start thinking about how to conduct those audiences. And from what I saw, he, he will be brilliant at that job, brilliant at listening, brilliant at asking questions, um, giving wise advice and sage counsel. I mean, this has probably been the longest apprenticeship in history. Your Majesty. I should in next Sir Keir Starmer with praise for the new king's first address. I thought his speech yesterday was fantastic, by the way. Who did you? Oh, listen, Kerry. It was <laughs> so reassuring. No, I think so was... reassuring, he said. It really hasn't seen far too long. Really. Then the Liberal Democrat leader. He gave condolences and said he hoped to discuss shared interests with the king. We'd love to talk to you about some issues on the environment and mm -hmm. climate change and so forth. But can I first of all offer my sincere condolences to you very much? And finally, the Scottish National Party's leader in Westminster. In the coming days, the King will tour the nation. Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast, the Prime Minister, will accompany him as the nation prepares for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. Damon Grammaticus, BBC News, Westminster. The Queen travelled widely across the UK throughout her long reign, and it's thought that nearly a third of the country saw or even met her during her lifetime. One of the places she visited a number of times was Bolton in Lancashire, and our special correspondent Jeremy Cook has been to the town to speak to people who met and admired her. Away from the capital and the palace and the crowds, a nation's quiet grief. Quiet, but profoundly felt. She's beautiful. There'll never be another one like her, will there? I mean, tears just stream down my face and uh, you've got to believe it, but it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. There's sadness here, of course, but gratitude too. So many lives touched by their queen. Telegrams and cards that mean so much. I got one, a special one for my diamond wedding. It's nice with that yeah. book, book in Palace mm. um, envelope. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we treasure that, we treasure that. Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh leave Bolton Town Hall. Bolton, in our northern heartlands, a royal destination over several decades. In 2009, it was Warburton's Bakery. A short visit, but lifelong memories. She made me feel exceedingly important, and that's what I remember about her. She was all about me on that day. Would it be ridiculous of me to say that that moment, that exchange, actually changed your life? It did, yes, because I'm, I'm still talking about it 13 years later. And, you know, I've met the Queen, um, and I remember when she walked away and she turned back to me and she said, keep up the good work. And I said to my colleague at the side, I said, wow. The passing of a monarch is a loss felt in all corners of the country in offering our deepest condolences and sympathies in passing of our late Queen Elizabeth II. In every one of our communities. She was not just the Queen, she was our Queen, Queen for all communities, whichever faith you were from. Uh, in particular, I'd like to sort of pass my condolences from the community of Makamos and the community as a whole. <clears throat> she was our Queen and we deeply, deeply gonna miss her. 
Al, the bus driver, is a proud monarchist. Good to see you. On your break. His patriotic outfit, a heartfelt tribute. I think the whole world is going to miss her. Really, the whole world is going to miss her. They are. Um, what can we do? We can, we can move on and as I say, support our new king. Take a moment though. Karen is all about helping and supporting Bolton's younger generation. She knows the inspiration that the Queen has given, especially on her visits to this town. It makes the community feel like they matter. Um, as individuals, as a community, as a town, that you know we're not just a place forgotten up in the north uh, when when the Queen comes to see us. So really, really important. Last word to Tilly, a personal tribute across the generations. Thank you for looking after the country and caring. Hope that you rest in peace. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Bolton. Let's bring you up to date with some other news now, some big developments in Ukraine, because after months of deadlock, Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia is gathering momentum, with more territory recaptured in the south and the east of the country. Ukrainian troops are now said to have entered Kupiansk, a railway city that has acted as a key logistics centre for Russian forces in the northeast since February. In some areas, the Russian retreat is said to have been a rout, and there are reports that the Russians have pulled out from the town of Azum. Moscow says to uh, regroup elsewhere, but let's bring you more from our central uh, Ukrainian correspondent and senior international correspondent, Ola Guerin, who is there. Ukraine's rapid counteroffensive is gaining ground. Its troops taking some casualties, but also taking territory on several fronts. Catching Russian forces off guard even surprising some Ukrainians. This footage was filmed by Ukrainian forces. We can't document the battles ourselves. For now, journalists have been banned from the front lines. Kyiv determined to win the information war. And images of victory from the eastern city of Kupiansk this was a key logistics hub for President Putin's men. In some areas, Russia's front line has collapsed. And liberation has come. Everything is okay, troops tell locals in the town of Balatlia. For six months, we prayed you would come, she says. Natalia, too, endured months under occupation by the Russians, who she calls fascists. She and her husband Volodymyr were freed by the counteroffensive, but still show signs of their trauma. When you saw the Ukrainian soldiers, when you realized they had come to free you, what was that moment like? What were your feelings? We thought we would never see them. And then our boys came. And they were so handsome. So beautiful. Especially compared to the fascists. I didn't know what to do with them, if I should hug them or hold their hands. I touched them and I was very happy. Ukrainian social media has been flooded with patriotic videos. The national anthem, now a battle hymn for troops, who believe that momentum is swinging their way. But the Russians still hold around a fifth of Ukraine, including the city of Kherson. This was the resistance on the streets back in March. It was the first major Ukrainian city to fall after the invasion. We managed to reach a woman still living there who says the Russians are starting to lie low. For her protection, we aren't naming her, and her words are spoken by a BBC producer. Over the past two or three days, the military 
seem to have quietened down a bit. They are less visible in cafes and restaurants. If street fighting starts, it will be very dangerous. I want to see our army here and thank them. I want to see their victory. Scenes like this are cathartic for Ukraine and reassuring for its Western backers. No one imagines a swift end to the war. But the Ukrainians have now shown they can beat the Russians in battle, not just outmaneuver them. Orlegiran, BBC News, Central Ukraine. We are just getting some new lines from President Zelensky. I'm not sure if this is his regular nightly address, but he has been saying that Ukrainian troops have recaptured now 2,000 kilometers of territory this month. He is also saying that uh, Russian troops, the Russian army, are making the right choice to flee. We've just had those lines drop uh, in the past few minutes or so, but we're going to take you live to Kyiv now to join our correspondent, Hugo Pachega. Hugo, always very difficult to know exactly what is going on, to be able to verify some of these figures, particularly President Zelensky saying 2,000 kilometers of territory this month. But would you say that this is what we're seeing now, the most significant Ukrainian advance for months? It is significant, uh, Lucy. It is uh, the uh, biggest shift in position since uh, the Russian forces left uh, the towns around the capital, Kyiv, in April. Uh, it is a massive uh, gain for the Ukrainians. Uh, also, not only because of the numbers, President Zelensky talking about more than 30 villages and towns uh, being liberated in the east, but also the significance of some of those villages and towns being liberated. Earlier today, we had uh, reports of uh, of uh, the Ukrainian forces entering the town of Kupiansk, which is a major transport hub for the Russians, uh, is a major uh, place used by the Russians to resupply troops in the east. And then the Russians uh, saying that uh, Russian troops had abandoned the uh, city of Izium, which was a major hub being used by the Russians in the east of the country. And now reports that uh, local authorities in uh, areas occupied by the Russia, by the Russians in the Kharkiv region, uh, telling people to evacuate and footage and uh, pictures uh, on social media showing uh, queues of cars with people trying to leave those occupied areas. Now, uh, we've seen pictures, we've seen footage of, of people in those areas that have been uh, liberated by the Ukrainian forces, residents uh, out uh, in the streets uh, welcoming uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, with kisses and hugs. So it is a massive uh, victory for the Ukrainians and could be a decisive turning point in this war. Yeah, Hugo, it's being seen by many as really a humiliating setback for the Russians. Has there been any official response to this from Moscow? Well, apart from the statement that the Russians said that they were regrouping uh, troops from uh, Izium and uh, the city of uh, uh, clear in the east of the country, we haven't had confirmation from the Russians that many of those villages have uh, been lost. But we're hearing uh, from official or pro-Russian telegram channels and social media accounts uh, some uh, reporters and uh, people in those uh, regions talking about the desperate situation for Russian troops, uh, calling for President Putin to declare uh, this special military operation a war, which could lead to a national uh, mobilization and recruitment of people. And uh, for weeks we've been hearing about Russian troops uh, refusing to fight, uh, complaining that they are understaffed and under-equipped. So it seems that the morale is really, really low uh, in some of those uh, parts of the country occupied by the Russians. But we haven't had confirmation yet that all those villages uh, have been uh, lost by the Russians. And Hugo, are we hearing or seeing any stories coming out of those liberated towns? Have there been any allegations of Russian war crimes? 
We have not, and there's a reason uh, for that, because the Ukrainians have banned the work of journalists uh, on uh, those front lines. So we haven't had independent confirmation, we haven't heard uh, independent reporting coming from those areas because of the restrictions uh, that have been implemented by uh, the Ukrainian forces. But this is remarkable, even those accounts coming from uh, the Ukrainian forces, because for weeks uh, we talked about the counteroffensive in the south of the country, and it seems that uh, the Ukrainian Ukrainians saw an opportunity to attack uh, Russian positions in the east. Uh, Russian uh, forces had been redeployed to uh, defend positions in the south of the country. So it seems that it's a, it's a, uh, the Ukrainians saw an opportunity to go out with, with this counteroffensive in the east and launch this uh, surprise counteroffensive. And that's why perhaps we're seeing this rapid advance by Ukrainian forces in the east of the country. And Hugo, how much do you think the success of the Ukrainian forces at the moment helps with President Zelensky? message to the rest of the world that he needs more weaponry, more precision weaponry as well, and aid. Well, it's very significant because I think the Ukrainians are going to use uh, these advances if they are confirmed and obviously if the advances hold that the Ukrainians have the capacity, have the ability to reclaim territory uh, that's been occupied by the Russians. For months we've talked about how static uh, this conflict has become with no significant changes in terms of military positions. Uh, for weeks the Ukrainians had been using these sophisticated weapons being provided by the West to uh, attack uh, Russian positions away from the front lines. But up until now, we haven't seen these dramatic changes in terms of uh, positions. So I think the Ukrainians are going to use these advances to uh, uh, show uh, their Western partners that they can go ahead with uh, a counteroffensive. They can reclaim territory that's been occupied by the Russians. But I think the message has been very clear. They want more weapons, and they want more weapons now. Hugo, it looks like an absolutely miserable evening with the weather there in Kyiv. We really appreciate you bringing us up to date on what is very significant with that counteroffensive against the Russians really gaining momentum. Go inside, get dry. Thank you very much for joining us from Kyiv. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has said that Pakistan needs massive financial support following devastating floods that have marooned vast parts of the country. He's on the second day of his visit to Pakistan. He described the situation as unimaginable. More than 1,400 people have died. Millions have been forced to leave their homes. Authorities in Sindh province have made further breaches to the country's largest freshwater lake, the Manchar, to prevent floodwaters breaking through the embankments there. And there are ruins, in, ancient ruins, in the south of Sindh, near the Indus River. They're around 4,500 years old. They are considered among the best preserved urban settlements in South Asia. Our correspondent, Sahir Balak, has been to visit the site. I'm in the southeastern province of Sindh right now where uh, I got to know that the site of Mohenjo-daro has been badly damaged. As soon as I reached here, I saw a lot of laborers working here uh, trying to repair whatever the rain has damaged. Uh, what I was told was that in mid-August, it rained more than usual. It rained around 1,400 millimeter, which is more than this place has ever received uh, since it was discovered in 1922, which was around 100 years ago. Uh, if you look at this site, uh, the protective layer, which is the outer layer of the stupa, has been totally damaged, but the original layer, that the original stupa, is completely fine. Uh, I spoke with a few experts around here as well, and what they told me was that what protected this space was the fact that these ancient drains, which is around 4,500 year old, uh, actually helped the rain to drain out of this place. It did not take any machinery, it did not take any laborers to help drain out the water, uh, which is a marvel in itself. At the moment, the biggest uh, worry for the people is, especially for the administration, is to protect this place and to bring it back to how it originally was. Most of the stupas around here have five layers of protection around them. And if one of them has been broken, it really jeopardizes the entire situation for this area. It is the oldest uh, site uh, possible in Sindh. And to protect it is the number one worry for the government right now. And what I've been told so far is that they want to make as much reparations over here and to repair it as as better as it used to look before. Sahir Balak there, and looking at how the authorities in Sindh are trying to really protect those ancient ruins. We're going to continue our coverage of the accession of King Charles. The official proclamation took place not just in London today, but also in Ottawa, in Canada, where he replaces the Queen as head of state. 
Queen Elizabeth made no fewer than 22 state visits there during her reign, more than any other country. Our chief international correspondent, Lisa Dusset, reports now on how Canadians are remembering the Queen. This morning in Ottawa, bearskin hats and a bugle, a solemn ceremony to confirm a king. His Royal Highness Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign, Charles III. A new head of state, Canada, one of 14 Commonwealth countries, former colonies, which still keep the crown. Thank you again for your welcome. It is very good to be home. For seven decades, she drew the crowds here, old and new generations gathering to greet her, displaying affection for her and for what she loved. From corgi fan clubs in the capital, Ottawa, to fast horses at the Calgary Stampede in the West, Prince Philip enjoying himself too, always at her side. In the east of this former colony, visits to 18th century villages. The Queen crisscrossed the world's second largest mass many times, visiting every single province and territory, embracing Canadian culture, including its national sport. I think it's absolutely wonderful. She's really touched the spirit of what being a Canadian is all about. But often, the Queen was on thin ice. The separatist extremists were making their promised demonstration. Sometimes the people who showed up came to protest. This was the scene in the mainly French-speaking province of Quebec in 1964, when separatist sentiment was at its highest, anger over English domination. The Queen knew it, never showed it, steering a middle course. Ottawa is a small capital, from her very first visit as Queen in 1957, she always spoke both of Canada's official languages. Better than even some of Canada's politicians. Another difficult legacy of a darker imperial past. The Indians were so delighted to meet the great white queen. For Canada's indigenous community, the monarchy also symbolizes dispossession, discrimination, Horrific abuses Canada's leaders are still confronting. <coughs> this morning's ceremony to welcome the King sends another signal. The monarch's representative, Governor General Mary Simon, is the first Indigenous person to hold this role. Other change could be coming. Recent polls show only a small minority of Canadians feel the monarchy still matters in their lives. But for now, it's still a constant. Lise Doucette, BBC News, Ottawa. I'm joined now by Dr. Carolyn Harris. She is a royal historian and author based in Toronto. Carolyn, lovely to see you. I'm sure you can imagine that here in London, the events of the past few days, what we're witnessing can feel all-consuming. How is it for you in Canada? Well, in Canada, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in the change in reign as it's been 70 years since these ceremonies have unfolded. And in 1952, Canada was actually between governors general when Queen Elizabeth II succeeded to the throne on the 6th of February, 1952. Winston Churchill had summoned Viscount Alexander back to the United Kingdom uh, to be the defense minister. And the first first Canadian-born Governor General Vincent Massey had not yet taken office, so it was the administrator um, of um, Canada who made the announcement. So 1952 feels like a long time ago, and so there's a lot of interest in these events unfolding, and a lot of looking back at the Queen's very um, successful royal tours over the years, and the number of Canadians who she met from all walks of life. It has not always been as successful in French-speaking Quebec, though. How much support is there still for the monarchy there? 
Well, one of the challenges when we look at polling data regarding the monarchy is that there's personal respect for Queen Elizabeth II and her mother, um, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, had some successful visits uh, to Quebec as one of her regiments. Um, the Black Watch was based in uh, Montreal. But when we look at the monarchy as an institution, we see uh, in certain provinces, particularly Quebec, that there is um, declining support for the constitutional monarchy. So it's interesting to see some people who are not necessarily monarchists um, separating their views on the monarchy from personal respect for the Queen's um, seven decades of service. Carolyn, we all watched very closely today when we saw the Prince of Wales, Prince William, his wife Catherine, Harry and Meghan as well, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They were at Windsor. Do these royal couples have the same kind of star appeal in Canada that they do here? Well, certainly the Prince and Princess of Wales had some very successful visits to Canada. Canada was was the first country they visited as a newly married couple in 2011. They crossed the country, they attended a citizenship ceremony, and had some lighthearted moments uh, like Prince William playing road hockey and the couple racing each other in dragon boats across Dalvey Lake. Their tour in 2016 was more somber. There was much more focus when they visited uh, British Columbia and the Yukon on reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and engaging uh, with Indigenous Canadians and the very um, difficult history uh, there. So the uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, now the Prince and Princess of Wales, have had some successful royal tours. Harry and Meghan lived in Canada for a time when they stepped back from their roles as um, senior members of the royal family. And there was speculation that they might make a life in Canada but then they uh, moved to California. But prior to them stepping back as senior members of the royal family, they made their debut as a couple at Invictus Games in Toronto in 2017. And that was a very exciting moment. So both of these royal couples are quite well known to Canadians. Very interesting to get your thoughts. Dr. Carolyn Harris, thank you for joining us from Toronto. Thank you. We're going to take you back now to Buckingham Palace. It's been the heart of the events over the past few days. People naturally gravitating there to share the mourning of the royal family. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, reports. If ever there was a moment for a child to live through history, to understand kings and queens, to mark the moment one era transitioned into another, this was it. Just a few hundred from the crowds of thousands allowed outside St. James's Palace to hear the new king proclaim. The youngest, Orla Elizabeth, 11 weeks old. It's history, isn't it? And I think by bringing her down today, it's something that we can talk to her about. She'll obviously be spoken to about the queen because she's named after her. Um, and then it's something that she can then pass on to her kids. So what do you make of King Charles so far? I think he's been absolutely uh, incredible, really. And doing all of that, what he did yesterday, um, the, you know, the day after his mother died, um, it takes gut. Um, and I thought he was absolutely magnificent. A real sense of trying to involve the people, his subjects, to bring them along with the change knitted by their grandma, Lottie and Isabel, had brought their queens. Why have you brought those down today, girls? Um, because King Charles mother the is the died. queen. We went to put flowers down for the queen. It's a moment of history. We wanted the girls to come and pay their respects and uh, see the new king. It will be a changing era, but I think the public are behind Charles and King Charles, and uh, it will support him all the way. Not everyone had the best view, but we are all living through, experiencing this new era. Thankfully today I'm not crying because yesterday I was crying very much. So, What did you make of the proclamation ceremony? I mean, like, it, it's emotional. I, oh my God, Prince Charles is a king and the Queen is not there anymore. Buckingham Palace was enveloped by people, mournful, celebratory, a swirl of changing emotions. There are vast crowds, seven, eight people deep on both sides of the mall. 
everyone just trying to get a glimpse of the new king. The royal car slowing so that everyone here could say they'd seen King Charles. It was worth the wait. Brilliant. How long did you wait for? Uh, we think we've been here about three hours. <laughs> so, Why did you want to come now? Uh, I just wanted to be part of this. Uh, just so important, just to be part of the moment. And what do you make of the new king? He's, I like him. I like Charlie. He's good. Yeah, I, I really like Charlie. Rufus, you, ju you just saw the king. Yeah. <laughs> how, how was that? Um, amazing. I, I won't forget it, yeah. Yeah. A pilgrimage to the palace, flowers to remember the queen, cheers to welcome the king. Lucy Manning, BBC News. To remind you, it was announced today that the Queen's state funeral will take place on the morning of Monday, the 19th of September, at Westminster Abbey. The Queen's cortege will leave Balmoral tomorrow and head to Edinburgh. Our correspondent, James Landau, has all the details. Here are some of the key events coming up. Tomorrow morning at Balmoral, the Queen's gatekeepers will carry her body to a hearse, which will take the coffin on a six-hour journey to the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The following afternoon, the oak coffin will be carried in procession along the Royal Mile to St Giles's Cathedral, with the King and other members of the Royal Family following on foot. There'll be a service at the Cathedral attended by members of the Royal Family. The Queen's body will lie in rest there for 24 hours in continuous vigil, so the public have a chance to pay their respects. Then on Tuesday afternoon, the coffin, accompanied by the Princess Royal, will be flown to Northolt Airport in London and taken on to Buckingham Palace. From there, on Wednesday afternoon, the Queen's body will be conveyed on a gun carriage up the Mall. The procession will pass through Horse Guards, down Whitehall, all the way to Westminster Hall, where the Archbishop of Canterbury will conduct a short service attended by the King and the Queen Consort. For four days in this ancient building, the Queen will lie in state on a raised platform known as a catafalque, and many thousands are expected to file past the coffin. Then, on bank holiday Monday morning, the Queen's coffin will leave Westminster Hall and be taken by gun carriage to Westminster Abbey. Members of the royal family are expected to follow the coffin as part of the short procession. And then, at 11 o'clock on Monday, there'll be a full state funeral at the Abbey, after which the Queen will be laid to rest at St George's Chapel, Windsor. And let's just show you now Buckingham Palace, where there are still hundreds of people uh, who have gathered. They're milling around, laying floral tributes, sharing their memories. Uh, many people just saying it's important for them to be, be there, to feel this moment of history. And that is something we're very much reflecting on our special live page that we have on the website. And I can really recommend going and taking a look at all of the different memories and the thoughts that people are sharing. You can send us your memories as well of the Queen and her reign. We've got an online form there that you can fill in. Uh, the other thing that people are doing up and down the country, around the world in fact, is writing in books of condolences that have been set up in numerous locations. And our correspondent Eunice Muller has been at Manchester Cathedral meeting some of those who have paid tribute. The late Queen Elizabeth II visited Manchester many times that during those moments of celebration, joy, but also during its darkest hour in the aftermath after that terror attack on the Manchester arena. And over the past day or two, we've seen thousands and thousands of people come through the doors here of Manchester Cathedral to sign that book of condolence, but also to light a candle if they wish to do so. So let's have a, a quick chat with Julie Ann McCulloch um, and her family. You've travelled across from Stockport, haven't you? Why did you want to be here today? Um, the Queen has been a steady force in our world and in our community for so long, um, and for all of my life. Um, and I wanted to come and just write message, a message. I wanted to tell her, even though she's never going to read it, um, that she was a woman of faith, a woman of integrity, that she cared about people. Um, and she cared about them at happy times and at sad times, and she was never frightened um, to have a conversation with people and to share sorrow with them. Many people here will have chosen their words carefully. For you, your background, you were telling me before, you're Northern Irish. Yeah. And that's another reason why you wanted to be here. Very much so. Um, when politicians were frightened to say things, she was happy to say things. She, uh, she kept politics out and she talked about people. She cared about our stories and she wanted to heal division um, instead of allowing division to continue. You so, brought your daughter here as well. Yeah. 
Sophia, let me have a, a quick chat with you. The Queen meant a lot to you, didn't she? Yeah, because I was a brownie um, and she was a brownie as well. Um, so I feel like it's um, something that I want to do when I'm older. And you wrote a message, didn't you? Yeah. Tell me what you wrote. Um, I wrote something like, um, I was very sad that she passed away, but sh she was a kind, caring woman that looked after everyone and brownies because she's a very special woman in my heart because she's a brownie and I'm a brownie. <laughs> Sophie, you couldn't put, have put it better. There'd be so many people who'd be saying exactly the same thing. Let's have a quick chat to, to Dad Jamie as well. Jamie, you were a bit reluctant to have a chat with me originally, but actually you do, you have written a message and you yeah. really did want to emphasise that, didn't you? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've heard a lot of and, you know, there's been a lot of words said is just steadfastness and this, the dignity in which she performed her role. And it was this constant um, in my life. That's something that we've always known. But I think for me, what was important, not just her service to our country and to other nations, but the way that she spoke about her faith was a main part of how she felt that she had the strength to carry out that role. You know, in the Queen's lifetime, there were many ups and many downs, but actually the way that she carried herself and the way that she continued to treat others, as Julianne had said, um, through those situations. And I think that was important for me as a person of faith myself, um, even her Christmas messages. But I think most importantly, it was the way that actually she acted um, that faith through her life. And I think that was obvious, not just to us, but I think to people across the world. And that's why it was really important for me to come today with our family, but into a place of worship and to be able to, to kind of give thanks for that and appreciation for how that lived through her life and she really did live out her faith through her life. Okay, Jamie, Sophia and Julia, thanks very much for, for joining me today. Now the Queen, the late Queen was actually here just um, over 12 months ago. At that time she was visiting politicians as she would do but also ordering members of the public uh, and listen to their stories after the pandemic, during the pandemic, and how that had affected them. And I just want to sort of mention one message that was written before in the Book of Condolence. She was, that person wrote, loyal to the end.